Hello again. This is our second lecture on the scientific revolution. Uh, we're having a hard time uh, through here. We all are in different ways with this virus and then with the storm last night. I understand some of you all lost power. I hope you're bearing up and can deal with all the things that are pressing in on you. They're, they're, they're universal and, and we just try to, try to bear up. I sympathize with whatever it is that you're, you're facing. Uh, as I say, this is the second lecture on the scientific revolution. This is for the second class of the week, Thursday at uh, 8 o'clock. And I want to begin by reaching back a little bit before we finish the scientific revolution back to the start of the uh, Protestant Reformation in 1517. Uh, after 1517, uh, it could not be conclusively, I almost said scientifically, it could not be conclusively proven whether Martin Luther was right or the old church was right. They both couldn't be right. Conclusive proof. It's not in the nature of religion to be able to establish that. Uh, what was clear after 1517 was that the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, uh, could no longer speak for all Christians, uh, not since really 1492 when he divided the world between Spain and Portugal had he been able to speak for all Christians. And certainly after Luther, uh, he, he can no longer, he can no longer do that. Uh, after Copernicus year in 1543, uh, it was, and I can say scientifically possible now, it was scientifically possible to prove him uh, right or the old universe right. They couldn't both be right, but Copernicus being right can be conclusively or scientifically proven. Uh, he was either right or wrong. Uh, the verdict for scientists uh, came in pretty quickly. Uh, most scientists uh, believe right off the crack of the bat that Copernicus uh, had it right. But for the upper levels of the old church, the Catholic church, and for the upper levels of the new denominations, all Protestant denominations, and for all the rest of us, ordinary people, I can say, that verdict was a long time coming in. Uh, and it didn't come in easy uh, because the evidence brought forward is not easy either to understand or to accept. Remember, there was a lot of common sense, not only Greece and Rome, in the church behind the old universe, there's a lot of common sense and understandability about the old universe. It's just not there uh, with the new universe. Don't we wish it was? Uh, gathering the evidence for the verdict and rendering the verdict, that's what we call the scientific revolution. And it takes up most of the years between 1543 and the end date when the verdict finally comes in uh, with Isaac Newton in 1687. Uh, Copernicus based his case for a earth, for a sun-centered universe rather than an earth-centered universe on math, not on the telescope. Uh, Columbus was 60, Copernicus, sorry, was 63 years uh, before, before the telescope. Uh, and when it did come, when the telescope did come, uh, the verdict, uh, let, let's see what kind of things were discovered about the universe that we hadn't thought to be true or even possible. Uh, uh, soon after Galileo's invention became known in 1609. Uh, first, there's the matter of, we lump these two things together, uh, mountains on the moon and sunspots. Uh, in the old universe, neither was possible because we regarded all the things out there orbiting around us as being not only perfectly round, Earth was perfectly round, but everything out there moving around us we thought to be, number one, perfectly round, and number two, as smooth and as clean as a ping pong ball. Very large ping pong balls, that smooth, that clean, orbiting around us. No spots, no moons on the mountain. Even a toy telescope, by our standards, uh, that Galileo, produced uh, showed that to be true. And then there's the matter of comets 
and new stars, uh, stars that don't appear in the ancient maps or in the maps even coming down to, to before Copernicus's uh, time. Comets and asteroids crashing around, making a wreck out of everything they ran into, creating havoc and disorder, and, and new stars popping up out of nowhere, apparently. None of that was supposed to happen. Uh, and didn't happen in the old universe. Everything was fixed, everything was set, everything was in place, everything was orderly. We talked about a kind of music that emanates from all that. And to have what you have to call scientific evidence to the contrary, uh, what did not go down, did not go down easy. And, and most people never looked at a telescope anyway. Uh, Galileo's own colleagues at the University in Pisa refused to look into things. Uh, so it's not, it's not at all a common thing for people to have access to a telescope or even knowledge what, 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 the thing, what the thing was. But the most damaging evidence that came from the telescope uh, in favor of Copernicus being right about an Earth-centered universe uh, is the one that's a little hard, the hardest to, to understand. And that was Galileo's discovery that the Sun, I'm sorry, that Jupiter had four moons. Not so much the moons, but that Jupiter's four moons orbited it and not the Earth. Everything in the old universe was supposed to orbit the Earth. And the discovery of these four moons orbiting Jupiter instead of the Earth strongly suggested uh, that Jupiter order orbited something other than the Earth. If Jupiter's moons orbit something other than the Earth, it's a very strong likelihood that Jupiter itself does. And we take it now to be more than a likelihood. We take it to be, uh, we take it to be a, uh, a scientifically proven, uh, scientifically proven conclusion. But not even that was enough uh, to uh, render a final verdict: uh, Copernicus right or Copernicus wrong. And to even approach a final version, a new kind of science had to be. Uh, invented. A couple of new kinds of sciences had to be invented, and this was part of the process of the scientific revolution. New fields of science spinning off from Copernicus' uh, discovery and, and claim in 1543. And the new field of science opening up is has to do, what well, we call it physics today, and it has to do with motion. Planetary motion to begin with and then the motion of all things, universal or earthbound, the motion of all things uh, at, the, at the second level. As far as the motion of planets was concerned, uh, Johannes Kepler, in the second decade of the 17th century, the 16 teens, laid out what he called, on the basis of math again, now he didn't have a telescope either, uh, or he didn't have ready access to one. On the basis of math and math alone, Kepler laid out, clarified the track or the path a, a planet makes or follows whatever it is it's orbiting. And the first law of planetary motion, it's only one of the three that I understand, the first law of planetary motion laid down that the orbit a planet follows whatever it's orbiting is not a perfectly circular orbit at all, but it's a long, flat, drawn out oval. We call those ovals, scientists call those ovals elliptical ovals. Uh, very flat, very long, and in some cases, very long indeed. You remember that Pluto's distance from the sun is 3. billion miles, 3.1 billion miles and that it takes Pluto 250 years to make, that whole, to make that whole trip. A lot of those miles, and this, this is where any scientist or anybody who knows anything about science is going to cringe when I say this, that any of those orbits involves a long straightaway, a very long straightaway, hundreds of millions of miles before you bend back or the, the trip out uh, again. And 
I can just imagine, or try to imagine, try to imagine this as a way of understanding something very much more difficult and involved. Uh, I can imagine a planet on that orbit, headed out, straight line, breakneck speed, path well lit, road open, thinking. Planet doesn't think, of course, but let's let our imagination run a minute and have this planet to think, this time I'm going to make it. This time I'm getting out of here. This solar system too small for me. It can't hold me. I've got momentum. I've got an open road. I'm going to make it out of here this time. I'm not going back to where it was that this endless, this endless cycle around is, is going to have an end. But at what must seem like the very last minute to him, uh, he's disappointed because he's pulled back yet again. And he won't have another crack. He won't be at that place again for 250 more years. He's pulled back again, and the process, the process repeats itself. Well, that is, I think, not too hard to understand that the orbits have a different shape. But what would cause that planet, or us, to think that the planet might have a chance, might be in a straight line, moving straight along a straight line, and actually have a chance to run out until the end of time, uh, to, 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 to go until uh, eternity. And what makes that thought credible is Galileo's uh, further development of physics to the point where he explained why things don't go on a straight line to infinity. They want to, and that's their natural condition why they don't. And the reasons he put forward are the same for baseballs and apples as they are for planets in the sky. And that's the universality of this, of this, law, of, this law of physics. Galileo believed that the natural condition of a thing was to be at rest, which is another way of saying Nothing moves unless it gets moved, whether it's a baseball or whether it's a planet, whether it's the force of God's creation or whether it's a pitcher's right arm. Nothing moves unless it is moved. And in the old universe, how far it goes depends upon how hard it was pushed, how hard it was thrown. That's what determines the length of its, of its voyage. When the force behind it subsides, the baseball sinks to the ground, or who knows what would, 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 would happen to the, uh, well, we know what would happen to the plant. It begins to return. It begins to return from, what, from whence it uh, began this, this, this long journey. And in that discovery, that discovery that there's something that, once a thing is in motion, there's something that stops it apart from the force of the original motion. The question becomes, what is it that stops it? And for the moment, Galileo had no answer. He could only speculate that it must be something like wear and tear. It must be something like he called it friction that eventually halts the Past the flight of the ball or the passage of the, of the planet. Uh, but to bring it back, to bring the planet back rather than to just have it fall to the ground like a baseball, that, that, was, that, was not, that, that was not easy. That was not easy to understand. And the verdict, uh, we still have to say, uh, the verdict uh, is, is out. But the search for what we call gravity is on. And that brings us to Newton. He's going to erase that question mark and, and answer the question of what, what stops it, what stops it from its straight on voyage until the end of time. Newton relied on two different kinds of science, uh, the science that we call optics and the mathematical science we call uh, calculus. Uh, in order to 
Well, he sorted his way through the whole scientific revolution down to his time. Newton wrote in the late 1680s, 1687. Uh, and he was not only a, a genius as far as his individual contribution was si to, to science was concerned, but he could see the difference between junk science uh, and, and real science. And he's responsible for weeding out all the junk from the scientific revolution. There was a lot of it. Weeding, a lot, weeding all of the junk out and winnowing things down to the bare necessities of the new scientific, of the new scientific frame of reference. That is, that evidence proves conclusions, nothing else proves conclusions. And using the evidence that he derived from the science of optics and from the invention, the, the invention, to, so to speak, of uh, calculus, uh, Newton was able to uh, calculate the force with which gravity pulls and to demonstrate, you can't see gravity, you can see the effects of gravity, but he was able to calculate the uh, force with which gravity pulls and also the fact that this gravity that holds the whole system together emanates from the sun, not from the earth, and that the earth is as subject to it as anything else in the universe. And as the earth is subject to it, in the same way, so was a baseball or a football. And that was the genius of the thing, that the law of gravity has a universal application. It's not just something up there. It, it, it's what holds the planet together. It's what holds the system together. And that was the universe uh, that we continue to think we lived in until the universe of time and relativity and Einstein and all that business uh, coming, 200, coming 200 years later. The universe has been remodeled. Uh, at this point. Uh, it's been gutted uh, and it's been remodeled uh, at, this, at this point. But still, no verdict. Why? Apart from the scientists, who, whose minds have been made up for some time, I think. Apart from the scientists, uh, no verdict as far as the rest of us was concerned. And the reason for that was that in 1687, it, it's been calculated that there may have been, on the face of the globe, on the face of the earth, there may have been as many as a dozen people, no more, as many as a dozen people, maybe, who could read that book by Newton <clears throat> and review all of the evidence put together into a final verdict. Copernicus was right. Newton wrote in Latin. Who reads Latin? Nobody more able to read Newton's principles in Latin than had been able to read Jerome's Bible in Latin. Nobody speaks Latin anymore. Uh, and Newton wrote in Latin, and he still thought it was the language, the language of learning. But it's not something you can read or I can read either one. And nor in English, speaking for myself, uh, could I read the eyes of Newton. Well, one English reviewer, book reviewer, uh, named Alexander Pope, uh, got a copy of Newton's Principles uh, to review for the reading public. And I know for a certain fact that Alexander Pope never read a word, never read a word of that book. Uh, yet he understood in it the, that it was the sum total it was the repository of a new standard of truth in Western civilization by which we continue to live, not exclusively, but continue to live. And that's the truth that, that's the, the idea that truth is based on evidence rather than on faith, or we could say faith in scientific evidence. Uh, the book had that sense about it. Newton's name had that sense about it. And Alexander Pope, who never read a word of it, had this to say about Isaac Newton's book. It's a wonderful little two-line poem. Uh, and it says, it says it all. The first line is this. Nature and nature's laws lay hidden in night. That is to say, unknown, unknowable, can't see in the dark. 
Second line, God said, let there be, and everyone's expecting Pope and me to say light, but that's not how Pope's line reads. Pope wrote, nature and nature's laws lay hidden in night. God said, let there be Newton, and then all was light. Let there be Newton, then all was light. Now we understand. And if we don't really understand, we take it on faith. We take on faith what we can't understand. We take it on faith that the earth is the center <clears throat> and the universe, the universe is held together by gravity and conclusions are dominated, dominated by and formulated according to scientific evidence uh, and, and nothing else. Well, this is a problem. Uh, and Galileo ran straight into it, head-on collision with it in 1635. Uh, he believed Copernicus was right. He didn't need Newton's gravity to convince him that Copernicus was right. And he said so. He said so in print. He was warned off it. He stayed warned, followed the rules, they left him alone, and then continued his research. But he went a little too far. Uh, he, he, he was on, as we, I've said several times, several of these men have been talking about thin ice. Ice could have given way at any time under him. And in 1635, the ice did give way, and he was summoned to Rome to appear, to appear before that dreaded body, the Inquisition. Where? He would be given the chance to take back what he said about Copernicus being right. And if he did not, he would be threatened with torture until he did recant. And if you know anything about the arts of torture, uh, you will think that uh, who wouldn't, who couldn't but give in before facing something like that. And he gave in, he said, I was wrong, words to the effect, I was wrong, Copernicus was wrong. He also had to give in some unwise words that he had written that seemed to question whether that, it's always the same, isn't it? Seemed to question whether that bread turns into the body of Christ, whether that wine turns into the blood of Christ. There was no doubt in the old church that did. Protestants had different kinds of doubts. Uh, Luther. Galileo denied all of it. He said there's no physical way that bread become blood, that bread become body, or blood can become wine. That may have been what the primary reason for his trouble was. We, we, we don't know. But in any event, he recanted what he said and was let go under a penalty of house arrest for the rest of his life. Uh, so the Inquisition meant business, uh, as always, uh, and uh, Copernic uh, Galileo found a way to do business, uh, to do business uh, with it. But his literature stood where his words had failed him, and we've come to think. I don't think there's anybody who believes that the Earth is the center of the universe any longer. And all of this goes to show what a difficult transition this was. The transition from late medieval to early modern was difficult and painful. It was a rough ride, I've said several times. Any transition is, but this was about the worst kind of transition you could make because so much was changing so fast. In 1492, you're told there are three new continents in the world, and it's not near as big around as you thought. And then in 1517, you're told that the Catholic Church has been wrong for 400 years. And in 1543, you're told that the Earth is not the center of the universe any longer. How much change can anybody take? There comes a point where you just get tired of your world being turned upside down, especially in matters, especially in matters of faith. There were a couple of things that eased the pain somewhat, uh, made it seem palatable, endurable. One came in 1660, uh, when King Charles II of England established the Royal Society. 
Uh, the Royal Society was a government-funded research institute for the advancement of scientific knowledge. We haven't seen such a thing since Alexandria when the Bible was translated, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. The Royal Society put out all manner of learned scientific treatises, which only scientists could or would think about reading, but it also put out a lot of interesting material along the lines of today's National Geographic. And it was widely, it was widely read. And you can see, well, science has some benefits, doesn't it? Science clarifies some things, doesn't it? And then in 1677, uh, William Harvey, a scientist, a doctor, basically invented the science of cardiology by straightening out for his time and by and large for ours what the heart is and how it works. That's cardiology. And anybody knows the benefits of cardiological uh, medicine. And you, you can see it right then. So that kind of eases the pain of this transition a little bit. But here at the end, I, I, I want to try to give you an example of the way in which science changed attitudes, changed the attitudes of people who had never and have not ever yet read any science. And that is in the whole topic of witchcraft. The belief in witchcraft goes back to ancient Egypt. Uh, it came down to early modern times, down to, didn't last in, but it came to early modern times. Uh, in late medieval times, all the way through, uh, you could be an educated man, you could be a highly educated man, and believe that old women and young girls mostly could and did make pacts with the devil to be given the power to do evil things on earth in return merely for their soul. Uh, educated people believe that. And they believed also that witches ought to be hunted down they ought to be tried, they ought to be tortured until they confess. Once they confess, they ought to be drowned or burned or thrown in a sack weighted down with rocks and thrown off a cliff or into a pond, whatever. Gruesome, gruesome stuff. Uh, it spiked during the Reformation uh, because witches were among those groups of people who had no interest in whether Luther was right or Luther was wrong. It made no difference to a witch. There were other such groups too, Jews. For those people, they're caught in the middle. And they got it from both the Protestant side and the Catholic side. Witch hunting became a craze during the uh, Reformation. They're not with us, they must be against us. Both sides. But as the impact of the scientific revolution grew so slowly, and as it could be seen that the new revelation, sorry, the new revelation, science, is kind of taking its place beside the old revelation, the old Christian revelation, not, not comfortable, tense relationship, but not contradicting Christianity either, uh, that the attitude began to change. Uh, the flashpoint came in America, uh, where in the Massachusetts colony, the president of the oldest university in the country, Harvard, uh, Increase uh, Mather, spoke out against witchcraft trials in Salem, uh, Massachusetts, uh, saying that, basically saying that you cannot be an educated person. Not anymore. You can't be an educated person and believe in this stuff. You can't believe that these women and little girls need to be hunted down and so on and so forth. It, it just doesn't fit with the new time any longer. What made the time new was the scientific revolution, however much or little people understood uh, about it. Uh, whether you still maintained that the old universe was too comfortable and so on and so forth to forsake uh, you could no longer consider yourself educated if you believed and supported uh, witchcraft. 
witchcraft trial. So in every sense, we've come a long way since the age of faith. Uh, and we have now in the course left one big last step uh, to take into truly uh, early modern times. Uh, and that is what's called the Glorious Revolution uh, in England. And that's what we'll deal with first thing next week during our last week of classes as such. We're going to 